dark scientist, teacher of Darth Plagueis, creator of the Maxi Chlorians, and architect of the future. How powerful was Darth Tenebris? Much like Marco Ragnos, analyzing Darth Tenebris' physical capabilities is something of a crapshoot. This is once again due to the unorthodox circumstances that surround his characterization. While he does have the benefit of actually appearing as a living entity rather than just a disembodied spirit, he is seriously lacking when it comes to somatic feats in both his major appearances and is held back even further by the absence of an RPG character sheet to flush out his capabilities. However, while this lack of information makes things more difficult, there is just enough information presented that I feel confident I can infer a set of statistics around him. Despite his species' long-standing tradition of sending their Force-sensitive members to the Jedi Order, Darth Tenebris was a male Bith. Native to the world of Clacador 7, Biths were a highly evolved species distinguished by their large craniums, streamlined respiratory systems, and the greater than human dexterity that made them extremely adept in the fields of engineering, science, counseling, and the musical arts. In the realm of personalized physical characteristics, Tenebris was distinguished from other Bith by the yellow eyes and pale skin common to Darksiders, as well as an abundance of Sith tattoos across his lower body. As can be seen by the few existing illustrations and textual descriptions, Darth Tenebris did not possess much in the way of muscle mass. And while I don't believe he was a total lightweight, his physique definitely lent itself more towards speed and dexterity rather than strength and power. Especially considering how heavily Plagueis had to draw on the Force just to keep up with him during their escape from the Valdebnik Caverns. His durability is perhaps the most difficult attribute to judge. All we know for sure is that he was conditioned to survive in extreme temperatures to a point and was killed when his apprentice manipulated large amounts of rocks to crush him on the aforementioned Baldemnik Caverns. However, it is worth noting that while he had no chance of actually surviving this event, he did survive the initial crushing long enough to have a short conversation, suggesting that his capacity for dealing with and managing physical pain was reasonably advanced. In our continued effort to focus on what's actually been stated, Tenebris was also noted to be less agile and possessing of poorer night vision than Darth Plagueis, over and above what the Force could impart, which makes sense given the vastly different makeup of Biths and Munes. When it comes to what we can say about Tenebris based on his own capabilities, there's one glaring factor that needs to be taken into account, that being his old age. While an exact number has never been specified, what is known is that he had completed his training, established a reputation for himself as a starship designer prior to meeting Plagueis, and trained the Mune for well over the approximate amount of time a human being would normally live. Considering that Darth Tenebris was almost certainly fully grown by the time he met Plagueis, I would estimate that the Dark Lord was around 180 years old at the time of his death. Some of you may be saying, okay, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that Biths, according to the Ultimate Alien Anthology, were considered venerable at the age of 85. 85. Yikes. While the novel does state that the Dark Lord is in robust health, it fails to specify whether or not this means robust health in general, like Anakin Skywalker, or robust health for his age, like Count Dooku. But given just how insanely far past his species' natural lifespan he is, I would say that the latter is far more likely the case. 
As crazy as it is that a darksider like Tenebris is still alive in the decades preceding the Naboo crisis, more impressive still that he's so powerful, fatigue would undoubtedly be a major hurdle for him to contend with in any sort of battle that lasted for a prolonged period of time. At the end of the day, I would say that the most accurate frame of reference for Darth Tenebris' physical capabilities would be the character of Inquisitor Jarek from the Dark Forces series. He was slim and dexterous, able to outpace and outmaneuver with the best of them, but at the same time past his physical prime and not invulnerable. Just as you must learn to crawl before you can walk, you must first analyze the ideals that were prevalent in a character's era before we can take a look at his personal mentality regarding combat. As I stated in my previous How Powerful Was, the Jedi of the Republic slash Clone Wars timeline were simultaneously enslaved to form and incredibly versatile due to both the lack of comparable enemies and the ample time they had to perfect their crafts in the sparring arena. However, as a member of the Order of the Sith Lords and the Rule of Two, Darth Tenebris' circumstances were markedly different. As he himself points out, the Sith of his era functioned predominantly as an unseen opposition, a phantom menace. Where the Sith once wore armor, we now wear cloaks but the Force works through us all the more powerfully in our invisibility. For the present, the more covert we remain, the more influence we can have. Our revenge will be achieved not through subjugation, but by contagion. I see this quote as effectively summing up the ideals of the latter Rule of Two Sith Lords. At that time, the focus was on the development and application of tactics and the Force not physical prowess. Deceit and subtlety were the primary means by which the Dark Lords expressed themselves both in life and in battle. However, while these circumstances would normally lead me to deduce that Tenebris, like Plagueis and Palpatine, was not a dedicated lightsaber duelist, we do have some information available to us that tells a much different story. To Plagueis, lightsaber duels were tedious affairs, full of wasted emotion and needless acrobatics. Tenebris, however, who had pronounced Plagueis a master of the art, had always enjoyed a good fight, and had clearly bequeathed that enthusiasm to his other trainees. Despite his overwhelming emphasis on science, Darth Tenebris was in fact an avid combat enthusiast with a particular passion for lightsaber combat. Now that we have that locked in, let's get into the Dark Lord's reputation and feats. No, no, let's have a look at his reputation and then we'll take a look at his feats to back it up. Hmm. Well, shit. Yes, when it comes to a reputation and shown and described martial arts feats, Tenebris has next to nothing to draw on. He has no real reputation at all, and not only has he never been depicted in a serious lightsaber duel with an opposing force wielder, but he has never been depicted in a fight, period. This makes things tricky to say the least, since we're essentially going into this blind. But wait, I hear you cry once again. Tenebris' other apprentice, Darth Venomous, was depicted in a fight, and they're exactly the same. Why don't you just use him as a carbon copy analog? Yeah, no. No, 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 no. Let's make something perfectly clear, people. Tenebris and Venomous are two different people. If we actually look at the book, there are only two similarities that are brought up between them. They're both Biths, and they both have an enthusiasm for saber combat. Not once is it brought up that their styles are the same, that their conducts are the same, or that their tactics are the same. 
Furthermore, Venomous is at least one-fourth Tenebris' age, so it's literally impossible for him to have accumulated the same degree of training or experience. This is how powerful was Darth Tenebris, not how powerful was Darth Tenebris and his apprentices. Tenebris' skills and accomplishments should be based on his personal skill set and attributes and his alone. It's okay to use certain aspects of Venomous and even Plagueis to reinforce arguments about Tenebris, but treating them as the exact same character is the equivalent of saying Luminara Unduli and Barriss Afi should be treated as the exact same character, or that Count Dooku and Qui-Gon Jinn should be treated as the same character. Not to mention, do you really want an analog for Tenebris to be somebody who stupidly overextended himself and completely failed to recognize what his adversary was doing before it was too late? Yeah, I didn't think so. Addressing his dueling techniques specifically, Darth Tenebris, as a master swordsman, would have possessed a well-honed skill set that took advantage of his strengths and compensated for his weaknesses. Although it's never been explicitly stated, it doesn't require much critical thinking to deduce that Tenebris was a speed and dexterity-based fighter rather than a strength-oriented one. Biths, as mentioned, were noted for their nimbleness, and his lack of muscle mass suggests a training regimen that focused more on maintaining cardio rather than bulk. This is corroborated further by the fact that Tenebris would have needed a high degree of speed and mobility in order to train and spar with Plagueis and Venomous, who themselves were noted as being more on the agility side of things rather than the domineering. While an emphasis on pure swordsmanship typically denotes a specialist practitioner of either Form 2 Makashi or Form 5 to Gem So, I don't see this being entirely the case with Tenebris due to a number of factors. Firstly, Darth Tenebris, as mentioned, is old and has a spindly build. So specializing in a physically demanding and strength-oriented style like the Gem So wouldn't make much sense. Yeah, he can augment himself with the Force, but that only takes you so far before you burn out. Secondly, his training as a general purpose operator points to a much more diverse skill set rather than a specialized one. As such, I believe that the most likely specification for Darth Tenebris's lightsaber technique would actually be a hybridization of Makashi, Naiman, and Judyo due to the nature of his character and the technical aspects of his training. In ancient fencing style, developed during the First Great Schism within the Jedi Order, Makashi was devised specifically for lightsaber dueling and had a strong emphasis on precision-based swordplay and speed, making it the ideal practice for a dexterity-based combat enthusiast like Tenebris to employ. Naiman was a much more general-purpose fighting style that combined elements from the previous five forms and emphasized the integration of telekinetic strikes with lightsaber combat, which fits with the latter Rule of Two's force focus and their necessity to diversify their loadout. Juyo was a highly aggressive style that emphasized sweeping strikes and intense focused emotion, a mindset that melds perfectly with that of the Sith. Equipped with a standard lightsaber with a red blade, Darth Tenebris would have likely executed his saber offense by pairing off the linear and efficient blade work of Makashi to the powerful offensives of Juyo, blending elegant fencing style cuts and thrusts with speed-based attack flurries and sweeps. This dynamic swordplay would have almost certainly been reinforced as per Naiman norms, with the heavy integration of his Force talents, likely telekinesis and Force lightning to quickly disable or kill his adversaries. In regards to defense, Tenebris again, as a master swordsman, would have needed to be at least somewhat capable, likely relying on swift parries and shunt blocks to dissipate his adversary's forward momentum, as well as the rapid contortion of his limber body to outmaneuver them altogether. 
While we have no instances of the Dark Lord deflecting blaster fire to draw on, I consider such skills to be a given due to his aforementioned training as a general purpose operator. I mean, come on, he'd make a pretty poor covert agent if anyone could just shoot him and be done with it, now wouldn't he? Similarly, while there is no precedence for him engaging multiple opponents, I see no reason to declare that he couldn't given his skill set and the fact that Plagueis notes how he and his master dealt with the Sante security squads following the assassination of Carid Sante. Finally, we've come to the point where we judge the Dark Lord's skill level. And it's here that I'm going to have to unfortunately rain on Darth Tenebris's parade a bit more. To put it simply, Darth Tenebris's designations don't tell us nearly as much as you may think. Yes, he's a dedicated swordsman, but what does that even mean? All that really tells us is that he has a passion for the art. As we know from a variety of sources, being a dedicated duelist is the basic prerequisite for, well, every Sith warrior and every Jedi Guardian in existence. It's a vague title that only gives the barest of descriptions that is made all the worse by his lack of feats. Sure, it's entirely possible that Tenebris is a tier 1 duelist like Mace Windu. However, it's also entirely possible that he is a tier 4 duelist like Quinlan Voss. Personally, I don't see either ranking as being an accurate placement for his character. Despite his dedication, Tenebris definitely did not advance his lightsaber combat skills to the level of someone like Mace Windu. Why? Because doing so would require life circumstances that the Dark Lord simply did not have. There's only two to three Sith, so he couldn't hone his skills against dozens of different fighter types. He's a general purpose operator so there's no way he could afford to spend all his time creating his own martial art. He's a noted scientist, which means his commitment to physical combat only went so far, etc. However, despite these circumstances, I consider it equally unfair to downgrade Tenebris to the level of Voss. He is a master lightsaber duelist. And as a latter rule of two Sith Lord, he would have always been prepared for an intense battle, even if he couldn't always win. Furthermore, while the implication in the novel is very, and I mean very slight, I don't think it's much of a leap to assume that Tenebris was in fact a marginally superior duelist to Plagueis, given his stated superior passion for the art which in turn would place him above your rank-and-file Sith Warrior or Jedi Guardian. Based on the information available to us, as well as everything we have extrapolated, I would say that the closest approximation for Darth Tenebris's raw skill as a martial artist would be characters such as Galen Merrick, Darth Zana, and Old Ben Kenobi. He was a dedicated swordsman whose technique was refined, elegant, and worthy of a master. And though lacking the same level of skill possessed by the true upper echelon, he remained a force to be reckoned with. An analytical thinker with a passion for predicting the future, Darth Tenebris was arguably one of the most intelligent Sith Lords in the Rule of Two line. While the aforementioned lack of feats makes judging his battlefield conduct a bit tricky, Tenebris would have needed at least a modicum of military intelligence in order to have successfully trained Plagueis in the arts of weapons management and group synchronization. Furthermore, his attempts to engineer a force-targeted virus that could be unleashed against the Jedi suggests a particular competence in grand-scale planning and coordinated assault. Following the death, or should I say disposal of his Twi'lek master, Tenebris assumed the mantle of Dark Lord of the Sith and maintained his position for well over a century. As with all things, 
His approach to furthering the Sith Grand Plan, or at least his version of it, was based around a very detached and mathematical mindset. Sequences and equations dictated his decisions, while petty things like emotions were pushed to the side. This reliance on pure logic enabled him to shape his plans down to the smallest percentile and multitask as though it was the most natural thing in the universe. So, yeah, Darth Tenebris, at least in an overarching sense, was basically a slightly less robotic version of Shockwave from the Transformers franchise. Your argument is logical. All that being said, Tenebris's true talent as a strategic thinker lied in foresight. As noted by the short story The Tenebris Way, his aptitude with mathematical prediction was so ridiculously advanced that he was able to anticipate events like the rise of Palpatine, Plagueis' betrayal, and even his own death with near-perfect accuracy decades before they happened. The story also makes note of the fact that Tenebris manipulated Plagueis by reinforcing his fear of death because he had foreseen that such events would benefit his cause. While it is unclear as to whether or not this emphasis on foresight carried over to single combat, I believe we have enough evidence to say that it does given his nature. Moreover, Tenebris's training Venomous in Plagueis' style demonstrates the kind of forethought one would expect in an anticipatory fighter. While we're on the subject of Venomous, I believe that the young Bith's tactic of switching styles in the middle of battle is a slight, and I want to stress slight because remember, they're two different people, reflection on how Tenebris conducts himself in a duel because he would have needed to test that tactic on Plagueis first before coming to the conclusion that it would work against him. However, for all his vast intellect, Darth Tenebris has one major shortcoming that we need to address, that being his immense arrogance. Again, kinda like Shockwave, he was so confident in the flawlessness of his calculations that he completely failed to take into account certain factors, or in his case, permutations that would offset his strategies. No better example of this exists than the Tenebris way. As noted by the short story, while Tenebris was able to cheat death by preempting Plagueis' betrayal and transferring his consciousness into the Maxichlorian virus, he didn't even consider the idea that what he had created may have mutated in his absence and inflict grievous consequences. This overconfidence proved to be his undoing, as the mutated Maxichlorians trapped the Dark Lord in an endless cycle of reliving his death at Plagueis' hands. On the whole, I would say that Darth Tenebris's tactical and strategic prowess shared the most in common to that of the Dark Lord Naga Sadao. He was an ingenious political and dark arts master who could calculate the future with unsurpassed clarity, and while by no means incapable of admitting defeat, he was ultimately held back by an immense god complex that made him prone to tactical blunders. Despite not having much of a reputation, Darth Tenebris was a worthy Dark Lord of the Sith who boasted a powerful connection to the dark side of the Force. In regards to his personal beliefs and outlooks, Tenebris, like many Sith, did not have much in the way of reverence for the universal energy field. Not only did he view the dark side as nothing more than a tool, but he went as far as to designate it as a natural amplifier that could be used to increase the effectiveness of his native capabilities. This willful ignorance of the higher mysteries strongly suggests that the Dark Lord's development was grounded in the manipulation of the material plane, as opposed to the more ethereal focus of someone like, well, Darth Plagueis and it's a wonder why these two never saw eye to eye. 
Tenebris's most noteworthy attribute as a force wielder was his extensive philosophical and academic understanding of Sith culture and Bith science. Being one of, if not the only Darksider of the Rule of Two line to correctly predict the circumstances behind his betrayal and the implicit rise of Darth Sidious. However, despite his scientific focus, he was dedicated to the preservation of his corporeal existence and the preservation of his schemes, mastering an array of practical abilities to coincide with his grand manipulations. Darth Tenebris is most notable for his creation of the Maxi Chlorians and his rediscovery of Essence Transfer, which were essentially midi Chlorians mutated into a virus and the ability to transfer his consciousness into a new vessel. Through these abilities, he was able to survive his physical death and piggyback onto the Maxi Chlorians, intending to use them as a medium to contain his consciousness. Though initially successful, he ultimately failed to perceive that the virus had mutated, trapping him in an eternal loop of recollection and brief periods of lucidity as he slowly died cell by cell. Furthermore, while the ability to use essence transfer is indeed indicative of substantial power, it is worth noting that he transferred his spirit into a medium that had no possible way of resisting. As far as other more esoteric force abilities are concerned, Darth Tenebris was specifically noted to lack any talent with Sith sorcery and alchemy, likely due to the nature of his more grounded headspace. In the realm of energy-based powers, Tenebris was a master of the Sith staple Force Lightning. As highlighted in the Book of Anger, Force Lightning, like many dark side abilities, came about through the inwardly directed application of power centered in the core of the body and unleashed outward. In this instance, the casting of lethal energy at a target in the form of a surge of electricity. In stark contrast to the more overtly destructive storms unleashed by characters like Darth Thanaton, Tenebris' application of lightning seemed to be more grounded. This is corroborated by his sole demonstration on Baldebnik, where he attempted to employ a low-level burst to short out a mining probe. With that in mind, it's likely that his application in combat would mirror what we saw with Dooku and Anakin on Geonosis. A quick, calculated burst intended to stagger or disable an advancing enemy rather than kill them outright. Now then, before we move away from energy-based powers, there's a little detail-slash-theory I wish to address. While the Plagueis novel describes Tenebris' lightning as blue in coloration, the sole image we have available to us depicts the energy generated from his hand as a fiery red. Due to this inconsistency, there is a possibility that this image may not be a display of Force Lightning at all, but actually a demonstration of the Force Drain ability, which involved drawing upon energy from without and parasitically feeding off the life force of other beings. Personally, I don't feel entirely comfortable citing one way or the other, since there is a precedence for red lightning and non-red drain. As demonstrated by his ability to briefly outmaneuver and outpace Plagueis on Baldemnik, Tenebris's use of force empowerment was prodigious. Though he has never been depicted employing the ability in a fight, his Bith physiology, coupled with the implicit nature of his fighting style, indicates that he specialized in bolstering his speed to allow for the execution of lightning-fast attack sequences and the deflection of projectiles. Furthermore, as the enhancement of reflexes is a necessary skill in order to be a remotely viable duelist, it goes without saying that a combat enthusiast like Tenebris was extremely adept in this field as well. Finally, we've come to an area I've been dreading, that being Darth Tenebris's approximate skills as a combative telekinetic. This is because he has only been depicted employing TK on two occasions, and they were for defense and utility, respectively. 
Both displays took place on Baldebnik after the aforementioned defective probe ruptured a pocket of lethane gas and caused a cave-in. Shortly after the initial explosion, Tenebris conjured a force shield to brunt the effects of the ignited lethane that poured into the cavern him and his apprentice were in. Rolling to the tunnel they had just exited and managing somehow to remain on his feet, Tenebris conjured a force shield with his waving arms that met the fireball and contained it. Thousands of flaming hawk bats spiraling within the tumult like wind-blown embers. Following the dissipation of the fires, he employed a targeted force grip to hold up a large amount of collapsing rubble and keep them from crushing his ship. His own arms still raised in a force-summoning posture, Tenebris swung around to bolster Plagueis' intent. While these feats do showcase a high degree of control, as he was able to hold back a small inferno and maintain his hold on several objects at once, they're also, well, kinda pedestrian, at least by the standards of true TK masters. Considering that force pushes and shoves were among the most basic and common of telekinetic abilities, it's reasonable to assume that Darth Tenebris would have at least been somewhat competent in this area. While I doubt he could literally shred sentience to pieces like his more powerful apprentice, I do believe he could generate force blasts with enough kinetic energy behind them to kill given his character. Similarly, while Tenebris has never demonstrated any skill with more subtle TK attacks such as saber throws or chokeholds, such abilities were common to Darksiders and definitely not outside the Lord's range due to his ability to lift heavy stones without much issue. In regards to more active combat, Tenebris's ability to penetrate the barriers of opposing force wielders, as well as the integrity of his own defenses, are, again, a bit up in the air due to his lack of feats. However, given that both skills would be critical in order to be a viable combatant, it's reasonable to assume that he would, at the very least, be able to bypass the defenses of significantly weaker combatants and defend against attacks of those of comparable strength. At the end of the day, I would say that Darth Tenebris's personal skill set and raw power in the Force was most closely akin to that of Darth Treya. He was a domineering Darksider whose notoriety stemmed primarily from his knowledge and breadth of skills rather than his world-destroying fury. And while significantly more powerful than most, he was not without his limitations. While his reign may have influenced a great deal of galactic events, Darth Tenebris isn't typically very high on fans' lists when it comes to their favorite Bainite Sith Lords. His appearances across various media are ridiculously sparse, his design doesn't invoke that much fear, and his characterization, while somewhat unique, doesn't speak towards the kinds of combative prowess one would expect from other Dark Lords. However, when one pushes all that to the side and truly examines him, it becomes clear that Plagueis was right to be wary of his master. Physically, he was a highly evolved specimen who, while past his prime, was still more than capable of outperforming a large majority of combatants with his highly advanced dexterity. As a martial artist, Tenebris was a dedicated swordsman with a fighting style that capitalized on his strengths and effectively compensated for his weaknesses. His form, at least by our reckoning, may not have been the absolute antithesis of martial expression, but it was still advanced to the point where he could contend with master-level swordsmen and be a viable contender in a variety of combat scenarios. As a tactician and strategist, he was a mad scientist who believed himself sane. A specialist in both mathematical calculation and espionage, he could manipulate virtually any situation to his benefit, and while severely hampered by an overwhelming hubris, his raw intelligence was simply indisputable. 
With his mastery of the dark side of the Force, Darth Tenebris was powerful and quite varied. His academic knowledge was immense, and his skill set fell in line with what was required of the latter Bainite Sith. Though his viability in live combat was somewhat hindered by his willful ignorance of the higher mysteries, underestimating him would be a costly mistake. However, the big question we must once again answer is this. How would Darth Tenebris fare in a contest with other, more well-known characters? Let's set up a combat scenario. The year is 22 BBY, and the first battle of Geonosis has just begun. Count Dooku has just made it to his secret hangar and is preparing to leave. However, in place of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker, it is Darth Tenebris, alive and in his Darth Plagueis novelization state that confronts him. Not a word is spoken as the Dark Lords ignite their crimson blades and begin to advance. Now then, given everything we have examined, everything we have extrapolated, and every conclusion we have come to, would Tenebris be able to achieve victory against Sidious's second apprentice? Yeah, no. No, not at all. Physically, Tenebris's Bith traits may put him higher on the evolutionary scale than Dooku, but his slim build prevents him from holding any sort of strength advantage, his extreme old age cripples him from having a stamina advantage, and his dexterity, while marginally superior, is nothing the Count hasn't dealt with before. As far as martial arts training goes, Darth Tenebris has simply not demonstrated, implicitly or otherwise, any sort of technique or style that would give him an edge in such a contest. Not only does Tyrannus employ a fighting style specifically designed to subvert dedicated swordsmen, Tenebris's most distinct attribute, he does so in a way that would largely cancel out the Bith's implied methodology. Dooku's own, and let's face it, more advanced application of Makashi would allow him to undermine Tenebris's linear blade work with his own, Form 6 is known to be a poor choice against Form 2, and while yes, there is a possibility he could use the power moods of Juyo to break the Count's composure, I don't see this as a possibility due to the Bith's physicality. Due to these technical restrictions, even if we went the whole nine yards and assumed that Darth Tenebris was of comparable skill level to Count Dooku, the best he could realistically hope for in a pure saber fight would be an impasse. On a tactical level, Tenebris may be marginally smarter than Dooku, but this superior intelligence does little to aid him in combat, as his mindset was grounded in scientific endeavors. Both are extremely arrogant, yes, but Dooku has at least shown a small willingness to learn from his mistakes, whereas Tenebris has not. A similar situation is at play with their respective use of the Force. Tenebris may be able to effectively contend with Tyrannus's raw power, but again, his actual skill set is nothing the Count can't deal with. Physical augmentation feeds into martial arts combat, Dooku has participated in TK duels with beings well above the Bith, the effects of Force Lightning offer the same benefits to each and therefore cancel out, and Dooku has more than enough control to resist the effects of Force Drain. As far as more obscure abilities go, Tenebris's Maxi-Chlorian manipulation and Essence transfer may be impressive feats, however, I don't see them being major game-changers here due to the ways in which the Bith employs them. Mutating midi-chlorians into maxi-chlorians is a purely genetic manipulation that is almost certainly too time-consuming to be of any use in combat, and as mentioned, Tenebris has never used Essence Transfer against a target with a will of its own, so judging its viability against Tyrannus is… sketchy at best. Overall. Darth Tenebris's inability to overcome Count Dooku comes down to many of the same reasons someone like Darth Maul can't overcome Count Dooku. 
as he would be pitted against a fighter of greater physical skill and more developed power who employs tactics that his skill set simply wasn't designed to accommodate, leaving him with nothing to fall back on once his weaknesses had been exposed. This of course isn't to say that he couldn't defeat any character of Dooku's caliber. It's just that the Count has certain advantages that push a hypothetical fight between them in his favor. For example, Tenebris would have a distinct advantage in a battle with the likes of Thalm, Quinlan Voss, or Aegon Kolar, since he would be able to match and surpass their skills with the lightsaber and leverage his Sith powers to his favor. At the end of the day, Darth Tenebris is one of those really solid combatants who, while not the best of the best, is still more than a match for the vast majority of beings out there. Against lower tier combatants with a limited skill set and tactical understanding, he is absolutely devastating. But against those who can perceive his strategies and deal with what he brings to the table in force, he could get subverted and get subverted hard. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this latest installment of the How Powerful Was series. Please leave suggestions for future character explorations in the comments section below, and I'll see you guys later.